Hi, I'm Dr. John Newfeld, and you're watching Back to the Bible Canada. I'm delighted to have you join me today. Uh, I'm finishing off a five-week series on the nature of God, uh, talking about some of his attributes. You know, I don't think I've even begun to scratch the surface. There's so much I could have said. Uh, I've only given five weeks to this, and, you know, sometime down the road I'll pick this up again because uh, we could really spend several years simply talking about the nature of God. You know, we'd examine each one of his attributes. Uh, we look at what it means when it says God is holy. Uh, when David says, where can I flee from your presence? If I make my bed in Sheol, even there you are. So uh, we can talk about God's omnipresence. That is, he's present to all spaces at all times. Uh, we can talk about God's wisdom. Uh, we can talk about his power. We can talk about so many things about, uh, you know, God's justice and righteousness, uh, as well as God's mercy and loving kindness. So all of these things, um, I've not even begun to scratch the surface. But I do thought, I mean, I do think I, I wanted to speak about the Trinity, because when it comes to this statement, that the God whom we worship is one God who exists as a Trinity, uh, a great many people, you know, they believe that. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things that Christians believe, but I am always overwhelmed at how little instruction many Christians have had on this matter. So where do we begin? Well, let me begin with the Great Commission. In the end of Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. So I want to stop there and simply say, uh, when you read it in the English, it looks like there are four commands or four imperatives. Um, you know, go, um, make disciples, baptize, and teach. It looks like there's four commandments, but uh, in the actual Greek, there's only one command, one imperative, and it is make disciples. So in essence, the Greek is saying, in your going, as you're going, because we're assuming that the disciples are going to go. This is what they're supposed to do. They're making disciples, and as they make disciples, what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to baptize, and they're supposed to teach. That's how disciples are made. So I'm going to leave the teaching part off because we're talking about the Trinity. But when you baptize, which is the initiation rite of anyone who comes to faith in Jesus, that minute they come to faith in Christ, here's what you to do. Baptize them. And what do you say? It's in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So at the very beginning of the Christian life, I mean, you've hardly begun and you're being initiated into the life of Christ. The very first thing you're going to do is you're going to be baptized into the Trinitarian name. So the Trinity is among the very first things that you're going to learn about God. And I mentioned that because for a great many Christians, I mean, the Trinity is something they do believe, but it remains a mystery to them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here by making a number of statements that are very important. Number one, there is only one God. Now, I've mentioned that before in this series, but I need to mention it now. There are not three gods and one God at the same time. I know there are those, for instance, Mormons will argue that there are indeed a multiplicity of gods and we can become gods, uh, all that kind of stuff. The Bible denies anything like that. Uh, so let me begin by sharing a number of scripture verses that reinforce that there is but one God. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, from ancient days, I am he. Well, that's pretty clear. It's very hard to misunderstand what's being said. A God who is all-knowing, uh, who has examined everything thoroughly. There is nothing in the universe that he does not know. He says, apart from me, there isn't a God. 
I know all things, and that I know with certainty. So what else can we say? Well, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, uh, if you're a Jew, you, you know this one very well because it's, it's often called the Shema uh, or Shema Yisrael, which simply means, hear, O Israel. And Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 says, hear, O Israel, Shema Yisrael, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord is one God. Um, so again, you get the very basic formulaic expression that you know, every Hebrew child was to learn. There is but one God. Uh, how about Isaiah 44, verse 8? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know not any. So Christianity, from its very foundation, uh, is monotheistic. That is, we do not hold to any God but the one true God. Now, if that's the case, we need to go beyond that and say, what is the nature of the one true God? And, and I've been talking a bit about that. But one of the things that are true of God is that he is a triune God. The one God is a triune God. So where would we go in the Bible to begin to find anything that looks like that? Well, we're going to start in the Old Testament. And when I do that, I'm going to say that the Old or the First Testament, as I like to call it, that in the First Testament, the first 39 books of our Bible, um, there is no doctrine of the Trinity. And I think that's very important because you have to imagine that the major drama in the First Testament is Israel's struggle with the idols around them. The nations around them were all not monotheistic, they were polytheistic. And so if God had, at, from the beginning, said, I am one God who exists in three persons, it would be confusing. So what we have in our Bibles is something that uh, theologians like to call progressive revelation, that God shares one truth and then he builds on that one truth. So to the most part, the First Testament will say, there is but one God. It's the end of the story, but it's not quite the end of the story. From the very beginning of our Bible, let me read Genesis 1 verse 26, and God is about to create man or human beings. And here's what he says. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. See, there God is speaking in the plural. Let us make man. So who's the company of people? I mean, what's going on in Genesis 1 verse 26? See, some people have argued that, you know, what really is happening there is what they call the plural of majesty. The plural of majesty simply means that, you know, uh, kings would sometimes, well, you hear the Queen of England sometimes do it. She, she says, uh, at least when her husband was alive, she would say, uh, my husband and I, but she would also say, we, sometimes simply speaking about herself. Kings and queens sometimes do that in Europe, especially in the European monarchies that existed. But here's the fascinating thing. Never in the Middle East and never in the Bible do we ever hear of a king or a queen ever speaking about himself or herself in the plural. The plural of majesty is never found in the kingdoms of the ancient Near East. So it's highly unlikely that God is simply using the formula, the plural of majesty. Well, what else could be going on? Well, other people have suggested, well, maybe God is speaking to the angels. Let us make man in our image. But that can't be the case either. And the reason that can't be the case is because we are not made in the image of the angels. We are made uniquely in the image of God. And so clearly God must be speaking to himself. But how does that happen? How does God speak to himself in plural? Well, the book of Genesis never tells us that. It simply leaves the mystery hanging in the air. And it's not the only time we find that phenomenon. Let me go forward to Genesis 3, verse 22. Um, and here, Adam and Eve sin, and here's what we read. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So God says, the man has become like one of us. He's speaking of himself in the plural. Or, or let me read to you from Isaiah uh, chapter 6, verse 8, which is a very famous passage. It's Isaiah's call to ministry. And God is speaking, and he said, or I'm sorry, Isaiah is speaking, and he says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Not go for me, but for us. I and us. You see, again, we're left with this strange mystery that keeps popping up in the First Testament 
that God will speak to himself in, in the plural. Psalm 45, 6 and 7 really is an important verse. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom. Now, you remember that you know, ancient kings would hold a scepter, a staff, in their hand, and it would be the symbol of their rulership. So they'd hold the staff, and whatever they say would be their rulership. So it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, meaning God rules. The scepter of your kingdom, by which God makes commands that are kept. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness, righteous commands. You have loved righteousness, saying of God, and you have hated wickedness. Therefore, now watch this, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So there's God, and we're speaking about God and God's God. And we know that there's only one God, and so it seems to refer to the one God who speaks to the one God, as if it's a separate person. And again, the mystery just hangs in the air, and we're not left with any explanation whatsoever as to what exactly is going on in those texts. One more, Proverbs 30, verse 4, and here's what it says. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? who has wrapped up the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name? And what is his son's name? First time in the First Testament, we have a reference to God having a son. Now again, how can God have a son? You know, if you speak to Islam, they'll say God has no son. And yet scripture, the Bible says God indeed has one. And it says so in the book of Proverbs. What is his son's name? Uh, In other words, we don't know. In fact, at that point in time, I think everyone who would have heard this divine revelation would have looked up and said, I didn't know God had a son. How can that be? So again, we have God having a son, God speaking of himself in the plural, God himself speaking to his God. I mean, all of that kind of language with no explanation whatsoever. Well, when we come to the New Testament, suddenly we begin to have an explanation for what's going on. And it comes to us very, very quickly. Hardly are we reading in the book of Matthew, and we have the story of the baptism of Jesus. He's going into the water to be baptized by John the Baptist, and we hear suddenly that the voice of the Father is speaking from heaven, and the Holy Spirit is descending on him like a dove. So you have the Father, You have the Son and you have the Holy Spirit all depicted as three separate beings because the Father is speaking to the Son and the Holy Spirit is coming as well in a bodily form as a dove. Now, clearly, I know that passage doesn't say that's a trinity, but it does leave us with a great many questions. And here's why I bring this up. There are, there's an ancient uh, heresy and it was called modalism. And modalism simply said, look, if you want to understand what's going on in the New Testament, understand this. There's only one God, but sometimes he appears in the mode of the Father. Sometimes he appears in the mode of the Son, and sometimes he appears in the mode of the Holy Spirit. But it's only one God who appears in different forms at different times. I mean, it's kind of like the image that people like to use, you know, you know God is like you know, H2O. Sometimes, you know, it's solid form, sometimes liquid, and sometimes vapor. You know, sometimes God appears Father, sometimes Son, sometimes Holy Spirit. That can't be right, and here's why. It can't be right because there's the Son in the water, and the Father speaking to the Son, and the Holy Spirit coming and resting on the Son. So you have three separate persons, not just simply a mode of being. And by the way, that's the error of what's called oneness Pentecostalism, not to be confused with the rest of Pentecostalism. Oneness Pentecostalism is a unique form of Pentecostalism, which is in fact a false teaching. Oneness Pentecostalism simply says, Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, if that were true, then tell me who in the world is Jesus praying to when he prays to the Father in the garden? Father, if it be possible, he says, let this cup pass from me. Who's he talking to? Is he talking to himself? Well, no, he's not. He's talking to his father. Um, And so, again, we're left with this 
this conundrum because we know that the, the, that Jesus speaks to the Father, and we know there's an activity of the Holy Spirit. So I want to give you a number of things to consider as we do that. There are a number of places in the New Testament where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are referred to uh, not as modes, but as distinct persons. Let me give you some examples. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, which seems to be a formulaic blessing that was probably very well understood in the early church. It's a way in which people would bless each other. And here's what it says. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So that's a blessing. Let me say it again. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, often when we, we read the word God in the New Testament, it's referring to God the Father, and Lord is referring to Jesus Christ. So here we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or here about how, here's how 1 Peter opens up, verse 1. To those who are exiles, uh, I'm sorry, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. So in one verse, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are mentioned. Or listen to Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, which refers to Jesus, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Lord, who is the Son, and and God the Father. Or hear about Jude 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, that's the Father, waiting for the mercy of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Again, all three are mentioned. And so what do we make of that? So we have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit spoken of as distinct persons, distinct from one another. Now, At the same time, I want to continue to say there's only one God. Now, some people will say, well, if that's the case, then it must be that only the Father is God and the Son and the Spirit are not God. So that's what some people, these are Unitarian viewpoints. And so they hold another perspective of Jesus. But now listen to John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And the word, the word, you go a little bit further down, it says, the word became flesh. The word is in reference to Jesus the Son. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Okay, so you've got the Son, Jesus, being with God the Father, and the word was God. You see, the word is not only with God, the word is God at the very same time. He was with God in the beginning, and he is God at the same time. That's what's being said in John 1 verse 1 about Jesus the Son. Or, or consider even further, John 5, to 23. Here's Jesus himself speaking. He says, the Father, referring to God the Father, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that, in order that, it's a result clause, this is the result that that, uh, the, the, the Son has been given all judgment, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. That is, as much honor as is given to the Father, the same amount of honor must be given to the Son. So how do we honor the Father? Well, we honor the Father as God. We honor the Father by worshiping Him. We declare His holiness, His majesty. We declare that He is sovereign over all. We declare His love, His truth. We declare His righteousness. All of those are ways of honoring the Father. That's also how we honor the Son. If we say to the Father, you are the only God, then in order to give the same honor to the Son, we've got to say the same thing to Him. That Jesus says, you've got to honor me in exactly the same way as you honor the Father. So uh, let me go beyond that. In fact, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, The book of Revelation begins by calling the Father, it calls him the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And then when we get to the end of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 13, it calls the Son the Alpha and the Omega. 
So the son is honored exactly in the same way as the father is honored. Hebrews 1 verse 3, the radiance of God the Father's glory and the exact imprint of his nature. That's who the son is. The son is the radiance of God's glory. That is, he's the shining forth of the very glory of God. The same glory that you ascribe to the Father is the same glory that you also ascribe to the Son. In fact, 2 Peter verse chapter 1, verse 1, 2 Peter begins by calling Jesus our great God and Savior. So we've already read the passages that have said there is but one God, And now we're being told that the Father is God and the Son is God. How about the Holy Spirit? What's said about Him? Well, I could read a number of passages. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, the Spirit searches the depths of God. He knows all things about God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11, He knows the thoughts of God. Uh, uh, Hebrews 10, 29 uh, says that insulting the Holy Spirit is, is as serious as to trample the Son of God underfoot, and more so than that. In fact, let me take you uh, to a passage in the book of Acts, chapter 5, 3, and 4. So Peter is speaking here, and he's speaking to Ananias and Sapphira, and here's what he says. Um, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie, he says, to the Holy Spirit? Now, I won't go into Ananias' sin. If you know it, then you'll be helped, but it's not necessary to know exactly what he did. But Peter says, Ananias, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. You've kept back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, he says. You've lied to God. So you see, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. Peter says, that's lying to God. So Peter clearly calls the Holy Spirit God here. So again, we have references where the Father is called God, the Son is called God, and the Holy Spirit is called God. And yet, we are told there is but one God. So let me go one step further. We're going to say that Everything that is true of the Father is true of the Son is true of the Holy Spirit. When we say that the Father is holy, we say that the Son is holy. We say that the Spirit is holy. Uh, When we say that the, the Father is omnipresent, we say that of the Son and of the Spirit. When we say the Father has wisdom of all things, we say that of the Son and we say that of the Spirit. Whatever is true of the Father, that is whatever attribute is true of the Father, is an attribute that's also true of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But here's the question that we might be asking. Why then is it necessary for God to be a Trinity? Well, here's a mystery because uh, I'm going to speak about how the Trinity functions first in creation and then in redemption, that is in our salvation. So let me start with creation. According to John 1 verse 3, speaking about the unique role that the Son plays, it says, all things were created through Him and for Him. Now, we know that God the Father spoke the universe into existence. We know that's the case. We also know that somehow it was done through the agency of the Son. I know I've, I've written a couple of things down here that, that tell me about that. I say God took the initiative bringing the universe into being, but the decree of carrying out God's word was brought into being by the Son. But we're also told in Genesis that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters of creation so that the Holy Spirit was, in a sense, uh, doing watch care over it or bringing the presence of the divine into everything. So we see in creation that the Father orders the creation, the Son does the creation through the Father, and the Holy Spirit sustains the creation. Well, let's talk about our salvation. Let me read a couple of passages of Scripture to you. John 3.16. Everyone knows John 3.16. It says, you know, God so loved the world. God the Father so loved the world that He, that is the Father, gave His only Son. So the Father loved the world so much that He sent His Son into the world. 
Or consider John 3, 17, the next verse. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. So here it sees very clearly that the father said to the son, I am sending you into the world. And the son does so. And then the father goes beyond that and says, but your mandate when you go into the world is not to condemn the world. And the son then obeys the father's orders and does everything the father tells him to do. Or or let me uh, go to Galatians 4 verse 4. It says, when the time had fully come, God sent forth his son. So it's very clear that we have God doing the sending. Let me read also John 5, 19. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does that the son does likewise. So what we have in salvation is the father is the author of our salvation. He is the one who put the plan of our salvation into effect. And the Son obeys the Father, comes into the world, and perfectly does all that the Father asks him to do. Well, let's ask ourselves, what then is the role of the Holy Spirit? And the Holy Spirit is this, that the Holy Spirit is the one who draws us unto Christ. And so, in our salvation, the Father planned our salvation, the Son executed our salvation, and the Holy Spirit makes the salvation happen. He enacts the salvation when we come to Christ. So in other words, the three members of the Trinity have a unique role to play in our salvation. But someone's gonna protest here and they're gonna say, I'm not sure I like this. You've told me that all should honor the Father as they honor the Son. You've said that the same honor that is due to the Father is also due to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as well. You've said that all three are fully God, that the three, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are the one God, and yet now you've turned around and said, yeah, but the Son obeys the Father by doing what the Father commands him to do. And so there's a lesson in the Trinity. The doctrine of Trinity tells us There is an eternal equality of being. Listen to me. There's an eternal equality of being. And at the same time, there's a subordination in the role of the Son. The Son, who is fully equal to the Father, found it his delight to submit to the will of the Father. Sometimes Bible teachers and theologians talk about what they call the ontological quality of the equality of the Trinity, or they also talk about the economic subordination. Taking all that theological language out of the picture, let me put it this way. If I were to ask you, does the Prime Minister of Canada, is he greater than you? And you might answer, well, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're asking a question of ontological being, (laughs) then the Prime Minister of Canada is no way superior to me, for he is fully human, even as I am fully human. You see, so I and the Prime Minister are fully equal in every way. But when it comes to the um, economy of what the Prime Minister does, then we might say the prime minister is greater than I because the prime minister has been given the charge to, you know, run the country, and I have not been given that charge. And that's the same thing that we talk about in the Trinity. In being, the Father and the Son are fully equal, but for the sake of our salvation, the Son has obeyed the plan of the Father and died on the cross for our sins so that we might be saved. So the Son submitted himself to the Father for the sake of our salvation. See, here's an important truth. Submission in the Bible is not a statement of inferiority. I like to say this. You know, when when the Bible says that, you know, wives are to submit to their husbands, you know, it's not saying that wives are inferior in any way to their husband. If the husband is called upon to take leadership of his wife, He's not doing so as her superior. He is doing so as her equal. And he is to respect her as his full equal at all times, even while he is called upon to take leadership in certain areas. You see, and that's what's happened to us in the Trinity. 
See, the Trinity tells us that there is but one God and that this one only God has eternally existed as three distinct persons. The three distinct persons are the one God. All that is true of the Father is also true of the Son and of the Spirit. And yet, at times, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit will play a unique and distinct role. Now, when I say that, when I say all of that, your mind might be swimming and you're saying, I don't think I understand that. Well, welcome to the club. I don't think I do either, simply because there is nothing in my experience that has ever told me or has has informed me of anything else that's like that. And yet, this is who the one God is. He is a trinity. Now, again, you're saying, well, how did you come to that? And the answer is, I came to that by reading my Bible. I didn't come to that by finding my way through and, you know, and thinking my way through what would be the nature of God. Remember, at the very beginning, I said, all that we know about God is not what we imagine God to be like. All that we know about God is what God has revealed himself to us. Is there an advantage of being the Trinity? Oh, I think there is. And I'm going to use an example that, that C.S. Lewis once used, and it's a, it's a marvelous example. Uh, Lewis said, you know, that uh, sometimes uh, in a trade union, you might speak of the spirit of that trade union or a, a club. You can speak about the, the spirit of the club. And he said, this is the relationship between the Father and the Son. From all of eternity, the Father has loved the Son, and the Son has loved the Father, and the spirit of their love is so perfect that he himself is a real and distinct person. Therefore, God is a relationship. He can speak of himself as us, and God can speak to his God, you see, because God, in fact, exists as three persons, and this tells us that God was never lonely before he created human beings. God always had a perfect fellowship within the communion of the three persons who are the one God. There was an overflowing of love towards one another and of delight that they found in each other, a delight that was so full and complete that nothing but nothing needed to be added. God didn't create us because he was lonely. God rather created us out of the overflow of the joy of being God. We are the product of the joy that God has in being God. That's what it means for God to be a trinity. I know it's a profound mystery, but wouldn't you think, that if we're going to have a conversation about God, and if God were going to tell us something about himself, wouldn't you think at some point in time we'd come to something we would never possibly have thought of on our own and about something of which we would say, I don't think I've scratched the surface on this. Truly, this is a profound mystery. But you, God, if you say so, I know it's true. For in fact, I know that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And just one final word. Normally when Christians pray, and this is often the case, and I've asked, how should we then pray? Under normal conditions, we pray to the Father in the name of the Son, because the Son has opened up the door to the Father by the cost of his own blood. And we pray also by the inspiration and the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit. To the Father in the name of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Does it mean we can't pray to the Son? Of course we can pray to the Son. We can pray to the Holy Spirit when there is a unique role that they play in our lives. But under normal condition, that's how we pray. We say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. I come to you by the unction of the Holy Spirit, and I know that I'm welcome in your presence. You see, it's a marvelous thing then to recognize that the only God has called us into relationship with him. And it's also marvelous to find out that the one true God is himself a relationship. How wonderful it is then to recognize that when we come to God, we are coming to a relationship of love and of joy and of purity. You see, God created us for himself. And now that we know a little bit about God, we can say to ourselves, oh my, I was not created for anything less than fully enjoying the being who is God, gladly falling at his feet, gladly worshiping him and saying, you alone are worthy. 
What a joy. Thanks for being a part of this short five-week series, a little bit on the nature and being of God. I hope it's opened your eyes, and I hope it's meant that you've longed for God more. And if you don't know Him yet, let me invite you to repent of your sins. Ask Jesus, the Son of God, to forgive you and ask Him to take away your sins and to give you a right relationship with God. If you want to pray that way, you find a godly, Bible-believing pastor and Bible-believing church. Become a part of that and learn what it is to come to know your God. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. May the Lord be with you. Thank you for watching today, and I want to ask you to make sure that you hit the like button and also subscribe to this channel so that you can receive any further notifications of all the videos that we prepare for you. Um, thank you so much for being a part of Back to the Bible Canada.